Okay, good morning. Um, so we're discussing heart anatomy and physiology. And when we left off on Monday, we were talking uh, about the cardiomyocyte. We actually finished up with the cardiomyocyte. <clears throat> and we're going to move on to some specialized cardiomyocytes that we find in the heart that make up what is known as the conduction system. Okay, so the conduction system. The conduction system uh, is going to be a sequence of cells that are specialized. So these are specialized cardiomyocytes. And these specialized cardiomyocytes are going to be organized in such a way that they can form a pathway. And this pathway is going to conduct the electrical activity of the heart. So we already know that the heart is autorhythmic, meaning the heartbeat originates in the tissue of the heart. Uh, and it's going to be this pathway cons comprised of specialized cardiomyocytes that once that signal is generated is going to be permeated throughout all of the tissue in the heart. So in the figure that you're looking at here, the pathway is sort of illustrated with uh, that greenish color to make it stand out against uh, the rest of that figure. So where does this conduction system pathway, where does it begin? Where's the starting point? The starting point for this conduction system is a uh, area of tissue that's known as the sinoatrial node. It can also be referred to just simply as the SA node. So the sinoatrial node or the SA node, this is going to be the pacemaker in the heart. This is where heart contraction and the heart rate is initialized. Anatomically, it is going to be located in the right atrium. And most of the time, for most of us, it is near the top of that right atrium. Again, because it sets the pace, the SA node can also be called the pacemaker. and will act to initiate the signal for contraction. Yes. So, the, no, the pacemaker itself, the device is going to be put underneath the skin, but there are going to be lead wires that go into the heart. Um, exactly where they put those lead wires, my understanding is they usually don't put it into the SA node because they're trying to get around the SA node. That's what has caused the problem. A lot of times they'll go through and ablate that tissue. They'll actually remove that pacemaker tissue, and then they'll put the leads in, and so then the heart... Uh, signal that the heartbeat is going to be initiated by the device to send the signal down into the tissue to get it into the conduction pathway and subvert the SA. Okay, so it's going to initiate the signal for contraction, and we have all of this electrical activity that occurs inside of the heart, and that electrical activity is going to lead to other cells, other cardiomyocytes to go through a contraction. So it causes initially atrial contraction. So that signal starts here at the SA node and it begins to move along these internodal pathways or internodal tracks. And as it moves along, as the signal moves from the pacemaker, 
and goes along these paths, it's causing all of these other cells in the atria to respond. And their response is to begin to go through a shortening and contract. The signal is also going to be sent over here through the Bachman's bundle or through uh, another pathway that leads into the left atrium. And we're going to have the same type of reaction, electrical activity leading to contraction of the heart. The signal is eventually going to make its way down to uh, the kind of interface between the atrium and the ventricles. And there's going to be a second node in that location. And we're going to call that the atrioventricular node. Okay, so the atrial ventricular node or the AV node. So the signal is initiated in the SA node, makes its way through the tissue of the atrium, and it gets conducted to this AV node. The AV node is anatomically going to be located in the atrial septum, so this tissue that is between our left and our right, right atria. And it's going to be in that septum near the right atrial ventricular valve. Okay, so not too far away from the atrial ventricular valve. So the signal gets here to the AV node, and actually what we're going to begin to learn is that once it gets to the AV node, it's actually going to be paused, or there's going to be a slight delay on transmission of the signal into the ventricles. And that makes a lot of sense because we want our atria to complete contraction before the much stronger ventricles begin to contract. So in the AV node, we have this short little pause, and then we move further into the ventricles down the rest of the conduction system. So AV node is going to pass the signal into the AV bundle after that short delay. Now, AV bundle, it can also be called the bundle of HISS, H-I-S, but pronounced like a snake would say, H-I-S-S. -S. So bundle of HISS, or the AV bundle. This is going to be specialized cardiomyocytes that are located in the upper portion of the right ventricle. Now, upper portion of the right ventricle, the AV, branch, uh, AV bundle is eventually going to bifurcate or break into other branches. And you can see that here in this figure. We have two different branches, left bundle branch, the right bundle branch, that go down the right side and the left side of the interventricular septum. So from the bundle of his or the AV bundle, we get our right and left bundle branches. And again, these are just tracks of specialized cardiomyocytes that can really uh, effectively carry this electrical signal that started in the SA node, was passed through the AV node. These left and right bundle branches are going to split. to left and right in the interventricular septum. And eventually they're going to lead out of the interventricular septum into the uh, wall of the left ventricle and the wall of the white, right ventricle, which we can see here. And we get this real fibrous um, uh, portion of the conduction system. And these are known as the Purkinje fibers. Okay, so the Purkinje fibers. And these are just simply going to be tracks of the specialized cardiomyocytes that permeate throughout the wall of both the left ventricle and the right ventricle. So we would find the Purkinje fibers located throughout the ventricular myocardium. And they will help to conduct that electrical signal to all of the other cardiomyocytes that make up the myocardium uh, of the ventricles. 
So the signal's initiated in the SA node, gets transferred to the AV node, short little pause, goes into the bundle branch, distributes to the left and right bundle branch, and distributes around into the Purkinje fibers. Now again, this is very specialized track of uh, cardiomyocytes. There are other cardiomyocytes that are not part of the conduction system that will just simply respond to the signal that's being transmitted down the conduction system. So heart rate is intrinsic to the heart. It initiates in the heart, but there is actually still going to be some nervous system control. And we need to talk just briefly about that nervous system control. So as we begin this uh, conversation on nerves to the heart, really think about the SA node is just kind of setting the routine pace. If I want to change heart rate or the strength of contraction, this is actually going to come from nerves that regulate the heart tissue. So we can change the heart's rate and the strength of contraction. These nerves that come down and innervate the cardiomyocytes and innervate the heart tissue. Uh, the nerves come from the branch of the nervous system known as the autonomic nervous system. And so what does that mean as far as your control? I'm sorry? Yeah, so autonomic nervous system is going to be pretty much under subconscious control. Now, there are some things that you can do, relaxation techniques and things like that, that will reduce nerve tone and nerve stimulation and it can have an effect on the heart rate. But you're not going to ever be able to directly influence your heart rate by just thinking about it because that is just not the portion of the nervous system that is innervating the heart. So you'll remember, well, let me ask, do you remember the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system? Do you remember what they were called? Yep, so we had the sympathetic and parasympathetic. And we're going to have nerves and neurons from each of these autonomic nervous system divisions. The sympathetic nerves are going to have an effect of decreasing heart rate. The parasympathetic. So we have a nerve interacting with the heart tissue that's a parasympathetic nerve. We can actually have a decrease in heart rate. Now this nerve or these nerves will specifically interact with the nodes. And so that pacemaker of the SA node may be firing away at 60 beats per minute, and we may get some parasympathetic stimulation, and it will reduce that heart rate. And so the pace will actually be decreased by that parasympathetic nerve activity. Our other type of autonomic nerve, nervous system uh, division, we're going to have the sympathetic division. And by now you should recognize this, is that we're going to get ready to either fight or run away. Um, we have that uh, uh, flea or, or fight syndrome because of the sympathetic nervous system. And think about what we need to be able to do if we're getting ready to beat somebody up or if we're getting ready to uh, uh, run away. We're going to want to have increased blood supply so we can increase the heart rate to distribute blood uh, over the general circuit more effectively at a higher rate. So we're going to increase heart rate, but we can also increase the strength of contraction. So increase in heart rate and an increase in contra uh, contraction strength. Now, we actually have multiple sympathetic nerves that are interacting with the heart, and some of these nerves interact directly with the nodes to alter that underlying pacemaker. 
Uh, but we also have sympathetic nerves that are going to act directly on the myocardium itself to help change the response to stimulation, to help increase heart rate and contraction strength. So we can actually stimulate parasympathetic conditions in the heart, and we can stimulate sympathetic conditions in the heart using chemicals in a open prep, open uh, prep of, uh, uh, say, a frog, which is what you're going to actually do on Thursday. You're going to remove the heart, and you're going to drip chemicals on that heart to interact <laughs> with the <laughs> nerve endings that are helping to regulate changes in heart rate and contraction strength, and you're going to hopefully see some connective changes with certain chemicals. You're going to use uh, epinephrine, atropine, and uh, acetylcholine, and you're going to take a look and see how those affect heart rate. And you should be able to begin to think in a little bit higher detail, okay, what is acetylcholine? Is it related to the parasympathetic or to the sympathetic? So what should we expect? Should it increase heart rate, contraction strength, or decrease it? That's what you're going to explore. Okay, so I've already said several times electrical activity in the heart. And that means that the heart is actually really good at conducting ions and charged particles. Uh, and in fact, the area of physiology that deals with the electrical activity of the heart is called electrophysiology. And the electrophysiologist would actually study both at the gross and the molecular level, what changes are occurring can cause changes in heart rate and contraction strength, and how is heart rate actually determined from a biochemical and a molecular perspective. So electrophysiology, a good place to start is in the SA node. And to take a look at the cells of the SA node and see what they're doing to generate, how, what changes occur to generate that pacemaker potential or that pacemaker rhythm. Now, before we can do that, we probably really need to understand the extracellular and intracellular fluid composition in reference to ions. So these pacemaker cells, draw out my membrane. We'll have extracellular fluid bathing these cells and then we'll have the intracellular fluid on the inside uh, of the cells. Sodium levels are very high outside of the cell. Sodium levels are very low inside of the cell. And we've seen that before. This is nothing new. Potassium. Anyone remember potassium? Yep, so it's the reverse of sodium. High inside, low on the outside. And then we also need uh, calcium. Anyone remember what calcium was? Remember in skeletal muscle when we were talking about that, all of your calcium was trapped up in the sarcoplasmic reticulum when it was unstimulated. So it's inside the intracellular fluid, it's going to be really, really low and high on the outside. So this is going to be our electrolyte composition, our ion composition, even uh, for the cells in the heart. And so we have an overall desire for potassium, uh, sodium to enter the cell, potassium to leave, and calcium to enter when the tissue is made permeable, when the membrane is made permeable to those ions. So that's the starting point for this conversation on generating potentials. And when I say potential, you should be thinking along the terms of action potentials. So the pacemaker potential is simply going to be the action potential that can be generated in the pacemaker cells of the SA node. Okay, so keep the composition of ions, keep that at the forefront, maybe even uh, write it down on a separate piece of paper so you have it available to you uh, for the next couple of minutes. So the cell membrane of the cells in the SA node, 
they are leaky. And we've already seen that before. And they're actually pretty leaky to sodium. So the cells, the cell membranes of the cardiomyocytes we find in the SA node are leaky. In fact, they're actually a little bit more leaky than what we found in skeletal muscle. So when we look at membrane potential in the cells of the SA node, what we find is that, oops, hold on, don't want an at sign yet, A, the membrane we can say starts at minus 60 millivolts. Okay, and that's what you can see here in this figure is we have minus 60 millivolts. Now, if we are leaky to sodium, what is going to happen to our voltage inside of the cell? So let's go back and take a look at our figure. We're leaky to sodium. How is sodium going to travel? So sodium is traveling into the cell, and what's the consequence of that on the voltage? Okay, so we are going to begin to drift upward. Now, how is this different from muscle cells, skeletal muscle? Sodium was leaky, and potassium was leaky, but it was controlled for because we had sodium-potassium pumps. And so we kept, and we always maintained a resting membrane potential right around minus 70 millivolts. In this case, we're going to allow that upward drift to occur. And what you can see is that upward drift is going to begin to move towards threshold just naturally on its own. This is setting our pacemaker. This is why it is autorhythmic, inherent to the heart. Because we're not correcting for that leak. We're going to allow it to happen, and eventually we're going to get to threshold. In addition, this is not going to be compensated for by potassium outflow. outflow. So here in the pacemaker of the heart, the electrophysiology is actually different than what we saw with skeletal muscle. And so the tissue is going to respond to these differences and the results or the physiological effect is going to be quite a bit different. So we're not compensating by potassium outflow. So we're not inhibiting that change in the increase in the voltage inside of the cell. Now these cells, they are going to have a threshold that's right around minus 40 millivolts. So what does that actually mean? Our threshold is minus 40 millivolts. Once we get to minus, filling for, minus 40 millivolts, because of the sodium that's entering into the cell, we're going to have something that responds. And once we get the threshold, we can't stop it. We're going to go through a full action potential. So what actually is going to happen once we get enough sodium into the cell that we get to that minus 40 millivolt threshold. It should not surprise you that we are going to open up some voltage gated channels. So at minus 40 millivolts, we'll have opening of calcium channels. So the threshold is determined by the sensitivity of the calcium channel. Once we get to minus 40 millivolts, it's enough voltage to have that channel pop open. Now, we've made the membrane permeable to calcium. So what's going to happen? Calcium is high where? Outside of the cell, it's now permeable to, calcium is permeable to the cell membrane, or permeable in the cell membrane, and it's going to cross in, okay? So what is going to be the consequence of calcium concentration inside of the cell once we get to minus 40 millivolts? How much calcium is going to be in there? We're going to get a lot of calcium. 
calcium begins to flood into the cell, right? The cell becomes permeable, calcium rushes into the cell, calcium has a 2 plus charge. What's happening to our charge inside of the cell? It becomes more positive, and now notice that that rate becomes almost instantaneous. We have, a, we have a, an inflection point right here. Sodium reaches, we finally get up to a, uh, the minus 40 millivolts, and the rate of increase almost goes instantaneously up to right around zero millivolts. Okay, so calcium, once the cell becomes permeable, is going to flow into the cell. And it is coming in from the extracellular fluid. Now, we saw that in part in skeletal muscle. Some of the calcium inside of the cell that initiated muscle contraction was coming from the extracellular fluid. Most of it was coming out of the sarcoplasmic tissue. Here, we're just getting it from the extracellular fluid. Now, even though we have calcium rushing into the cell, we're still going to have sodium that continues to leak out. Or not out, I'm sorry, uh, continues to leak in. Since it's high outside. So now we have not only calcium coming in, but we also have sodium coming in. So even more positive molecules or ions are coming into the cell. And so once we get to that minus 40, because of all the positive that are coming in, we have a quick rise that we're going to call an action potential. Now that quick rise, we're going to peak out at just above zero millivolts. Anyone remember what it was in skeletal muscle? Minus 90, minus 70, minus 90 is nerves, minus 70 is muscles. That's our resting membrane potential. Where do we peak out? Plus 35. Okay, so now we're only going to, to zero millivolts. So we're not going all the way up to uh, to a plus 35. Does everybody, everybody have all of this? Okay, so we're at zero millivolts right here at the top of the peak. What's going to happen? That's obviously where we're coming back down. So what's the physiological reason that we're going to begin to dip back down towards minus 60 millivolts? Potassium. Now, potassium, tell me about its orientation in the intracellular fluid, high or low? High low. Okay, it's high in the intracellular fluid. So if I make the membrane permeable, how's it going to cross? It's going to flow out, and what's going to be the consequence on the cell's uh, voltage? It's going to drop. Okay, so how come it hasn't been decreasing already? What do you think is... Okay, but why, why hasn't potassium left already? We're going to need to, to, to cause the channel to open up. Okay, so potassium channels are going to open. And they have a much higher threshold. The calcium channels had a threshold right at minus 40 millivolts, and they would swing open. These channels are designed so that they actually will open up at zero millivolts. So potassium can't even really cross the cell until zero millivolts when those channels actually finally are stimulated. We reach the threshold of those channels and they open up. The gate opens up in response to that zero millivolt uh, uh, voltage. And potassium rushes out. And as potassium rushes out of the cell, the cell, now we're losing positives. We put a bunch of positives into the intracellular fluid. Now potassium's pushing its way out, so we're losing a bunch of positives. So the cell is going to undergo repolarization.
and we're going to return back down towards minus 60 millivolts. And we're now going to begin the whole process over again. 60 millivolts, sodium begins to flow back out. We might get to minus 40 millivolts. Calcium channels open, sodium continues to flow out, Cal or, uh, begins to flow in, continues to flow in, calcium begins to flow in. We spike up to zero millivolts. That stimuli triggers the potassium channels to open up. Potassium begins to rush out of the cell, bringing the uh, voltage back down towards minus 60 millivolts. So we begin to updrift again, over and over and over again, setting the pace for the heart. Each action potential will result in one heartbeat. Okay. 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 Yeah, it's just going to be reverted by channels that are going to expend ATP and pump those ions back out. Just like we saw in the muscle. They are always on, but they get overwhelmed once we start reaching these thresholds. So calcium flow and calcium, the calcium current it's actually going to turn off here, and it's going to, um, so calcium will get pumped back out of the cell as potassium is going through and doing its thing. And then over here, while well, we're going through this process before we open potassium back up, potassium is being pushed back into the cell by those pumps. Um, I, yes. So, like, I guess when people were studying this, trying to figure out how the heart works and all that, like, how? Work, all this stuff. Like, yeah. Do they just look at an individual cell or the whole heart? Or well, it started out with the heart, and some of the stuff that that you're actually going to do this semester was some of the things that they started out with. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they knew about things like acetylcholine. So what if we put acetylcholine on the heart? What happens? Mm -hmm. And as it progressed, as time progressed, one of the major um, advances in technology that really made not only studying electrophysiology of the heart but all of our other tissues was a technique called the patch clamp. And not to get too much detail in here, but a patch clamp is basically a giant expensive voltmeter. And they have big dissecting microscope and these little manipulators that they can control, these tiny little pipettes that they draw out, so they're made out of borosilicate glass. And you've seen borosilicate because we use those for the hooks when we're pulling the nerve um, out of the frog last semester. You can heat that up with special tools. You can pull those out, the borosilicate glass pipettes, just like what we had. We could pull it out, and it creates a really, really small diameter opening. So small, in fact, that you actually can set that under microscopy onto the membrane and you can trap, so this would be our pipette here, you can trap an individual protein at the end of that uh, uh, pipette. And so you get a patch and you clamp that patch of membrane and this would have a little electrode in it and that electrode um, would be take juxtaposed against another electrode that you put into the exercise of fluid. Now with that setup, anything that flows through, you can actually begin to measure currents and changes in voltage for that single coke protein. So we can hit a cal we can try to hit a calcium channel, we can try to hit the sodium channels. Um, the other thing too that's made all of this more feasible is we now have sequenced genomes of hundreds of animals and, and even humans. And so we've actually gone through and we've found additional genes that uh, code for these proteins that exist in the, uh, in the membrane. And we have to, we've developed techniques where we can look at those proteins as they're expressed, see how many are present in a certain amount of tissue. So yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of really, really neat technology that um, has gone into discovering how all of this, how all of this works. Probably the patch clamp is going to be one of the most uh, important advances in technology because it gave us the ability to begin to look at 
the individual proteins functions and it doesn't necessarily just have to be an individual protein they used to just make them really big in terms of the cell and they patch clamp on a whole area of the membrane on an individual cardiomyocyte and they would measure what was going on uh, with currents and yeah the other thing that we can do now coupled alongside of patch clamp is there are now um, calcium, sodium, and potassium ions that have been tagged with fluorescence. So under microscopy, you can actually stimulate the calcium molecules that you've put into the system so that they glow, and you can watch them crossing through the membrane. It's crazy stuff. You got me all excited now. <laughs> I don't even know where I am. Um, Process starts over. Okay. So one impulse at the SA node is going to equal one heartbeat. So one contraction of the heart. So this signal initiates at a just small group of cells in the SA node. Those changes in voltage are picked up through the intercalated discs and all of those communication pathways in surrounding cells. And the signal begins to perk. And all of these other cells begin to go through action potentials. So it starts at the SA node, and then the surrounding cells begin to go through action potential, and they begin to contract. And the next kind of ring of cells, they begin to go through. Uh, the Signal is generated, the SA node is going to follow that conduction path and it's going to move out and permeate throughout the atrial tissue. It's going to follow down that conduction path until eventually that signal makes its way into the ventricles. So the signal is passed to the ventricles. I've already just mentioned this, but just to have it in your notes, the SA node, the signal that is generated in the SA node is going to spread through the surrounding other cells. So out into the other cardiomyocytes, the non-specialized cardiomyocytes, they respond with an action potential and a contraction also gets con conducted down the internodal pathway. And the result here is for the atria to contract. Now, I don't think it's really poor design that the SA node is up towards the top, kind of right corner of the heart, because now we actually have this motion where the heart kind of squeezes all of the blood, kind of squeezes the blood down towards the AV valve to push it into the ventricle. So not only are the atria contracting, but they're contracting in such a way that they really wring a lot of blood out into the left ventricle. That signal, as the atria contracts, is eventually going to make it to the AV node, so the AV node will be stimulated. AV node is stimulated. Now, once the AV node is stimulated, that signal is passed into the ventricles and the cardiomyocytes of the ventricles. To stimulate them. Now, again, I've already mentioned this, but we want the atria to contract first. The atrium, uh, right and left, left and right atrium to contract first before the ventricles contract. Because if they contract at the same time, we're just going to squish blood back and forth and we're never going to push it out into our circulation. So once the signal goes through or enters the AV node, the signal is going to slow down. So the signal slows in the AV node. Now, this figure here for the action potential inside of the SA node with the leakiness for sodium that basically is the initiating 
factor that drives the action potential to form, that's not going to be repeated in other tissues and other cells within the heart, even within the conduction system. It's actually going to be a little bit different. It's not the other parts of the heart are going to be as leaky to sodium as the SA node. And the reason that is is because we want the SA node to set the pace. If other portions of the heart start to set the pace, you're going to have erroneous contraction. If you have contraction that starts very low in the atria, you're going to have very uh, uh, poor contraction of the, atria, uh, of the atria pushing blood into the ventricle, and you're going to reduce your ability to circulate blood effectively. And we would call those dysrhythmias, um, and that's a whole other uh, class in electrocardiography. If you ever become a cardiac nurse, you'll, you'll take those classes and get trained in, in, in that area. But it all goes back to where the signal is being generated and how that signal is passed along. If it's generated in the wrong place or the wrong location, it's going to change how the heart actually functions. So the signal slows in the AV mode. Now, why does it actually slow down? Besides the differences in the leakiness to sodium, the AV node and the cardiomyocytes, they actually have less gap junctions. So there's a lower number, not lower number of gap junctions present in these cells. And that lower number of gap junctions means that the signal is actually not going to be passed as efficiently. It's enough to make that signal slow down so that it takes longer for the signal to go from cell to cell to cell before it gets permeated into the bundle of his, the AV bundle. So it results in a decreased signal to neighboring cells. And accounts for most of the delay. Now again, that's very specific to the cardiomyocytes that we would find in the AV node. Outside of the AV node, there's a reasonable number of gap junctions. Other parts of the ventricles and the atria are going to have high numbers of gap junctions. It's just the cells that make up the AV node, that little cluster of cells in the AV node to cause that delay. All right, let's talk about the action potential inside of the ventricles. Now, this figure that you're looking at here, you should recognize this top corner panel. This is the uh, action potential wave, what the wave would look like in the SN. Notice that as you move throughout the heart, that signature actually becomes a little bit different in appearance. And what that means is that there is some slightly different physiology occurring at each of these locations along the conduction system and then throughout the heart as well. Now, we don't have time to go over what causes the plateau in the atria, what causes the extension of the plateau in the bundle of his, what causes the over-exaggeration in the ventricle and the Purkinje network. So we're only going to really just talk about just one of these examples and understand that there's delay here because of the lower gap junction, but all of these others, we have some additional physiology that's going on, and it's occurring at different levels depending on where you are within the atria, the bundle of hips, the Purkinje network, or the ventricle, the tissues, of, the tissues making up the ventricle. Okay, so the action potential in the ventricle, so how do we actually get a signature that looks like that? We have this nice plateau that occurs there. First of all, there is no pacemaker. So the ventricles, there is no pacemaker. And what that means is the ventricle cardiomyocytes are not leaky to sodium. We don't have that same mechanism. We're just going to find that in the SA node under normal physiological circumstances. So we do actually need to be stimulated. The SA node doesn't really need stimulation to create an electrical potential. It's automatically going to do that because of the weakness of sodium. 
the ventricles and the atrium and the AV node, the bundle of hiss and the Purkinje network are all going to need to be stimulated. So we have to use that action potential generated at the SA node to stimulate all of these other regions. And these other regions are going to respond to that electrical stimulation. Now, upon electrical stimulation, the response, it's still going to involve sodium, but it's not leaky anymore. The sodium is actually going to begin to move through the cell when it is called upon by a change in voltage. So it's going to be a voltage-gated channel that responds to allow sodium to begin to cross the membrane. So as that signal leaves the SA node and enters the tissue of the atrium or all of these other locations, the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to have voltage-gated sodium channels that open up. Okay, thinking back on our extracellular, intracellular fluid, what's going to happen to sodium when the membrane becomes permeable? All I heard was a yawn. Okay, so we're going to have sodium inflow. So if you know, if you remember that figure that I put up, you can understand so much of the stuff that's going on just based off of the composition of the intracellular and extracellular. So our sodium channels open up and we have sodium inflow. Now, as sodium begins to inflow, we actually have two different types of sodium channels. We have some that are really sensitive and some that are insensitive. Voltage, initial voltage, causes these real sensitive sodium channels to open up, and we have a small influx of sodium. That inflow of sodium, which is going to increase cardiomyocyte voltage, is going to result in the opening of other sodium channels. And then we get even more sodium entering into the cell. Now, the result here of the signal causing the initial small amount of sodium channels and then a much larger amount of sodium channels opening up means we have tons of sodium that enters into the cell almost instantaneously. And this results in a rapid change in membrane potential. Now, that rapid change in membrane potential, we're going to go right from around our minus 60 millivolt, maybe uh, in some cases lower than that, closer to minus 90 or up minus 100 millivolt, depending on what tissue we're in. We're going to go from that resting membrane potential up to plus 30 millivolts. Now, at 30 millivolts, the sodium channels have had enough time to be open, and they're going to begin to close. So sodium influxes big time. We get up to plus 30 millivolts. Now sodium channels are going to begin to close. Now, what is this... What does this plateau mean? Whether we're looking at the bundle of hiss, the atria, the ventricles, what does that mean in terms of voltage? Yeah, we're going to keep that voltage pretty constant for a short amount of time. We're not going to have this immediate drop. We get up and then we begin to drop back down. Voltage is going to get up to plus 30 millivolts and then it's going to drop just a little bit and we're actually going to sustain it for a short amount of time before we go back through a full repolarization. So what we will pick up with on Friday is what is the physiological reason and the electrophysiology for the plateau that forms.